Welcome back to day two of 28 Days of Color. Today's topic is color and cosplay. We'll be discussing our own Catwoman, Eartha Kitt, for our history lesson, and we'll have an interview with Kenyatta Todd, who does cosplay herself. Stay tuned. Eartha Kitt was an American singer, actress, dancer, voice actress, comedian, activist, author, and songwriter, known for her highly distinctive singing style and her 1953 recordings of C'est Si Bon and the Christmas novelty song Santa Baby, both of which reached the top 10 on the Billboard Hot 100. Born in North South Carolina, the famed singer and actress Eartha Kitt had a difficult childhood. Her mother abandoned her and she was left in the care of relatives who mistreated her. Kid was often teased and picked on because of her mixed race heritage. Her father was white and her mother was an African American and Cherokee. Around the age of eight, Kit moved to New York City to live with an aunt. There, she eventually enrolled in the New York School of Performing Arts. Around the age of 16, Kit won a scholarship to study with Katherine Dunham and later joined Dunham's dance troupe. She toured with the group for several years before going solo. In Paris, Kit became a popular nightclub singer. She was discovered in Europe by actor and director Orson Welles. Welles, who reportedly called her the most exciting woman alive, cast her as Helen of Troy in his production of Dr. Faustus. On the big screen, Kit starred opposite Nat King Cole in the W.C. Handy biopic St. Louis Blues in 1958. She netted her one and only Academy Award nomination the following year for her role as the title character in Anna LaCosta. In the film, Kid plays a sassy young woman who was forced to use her womanly wiles to survive, starring opposite Sammy Davis Jr. In the late 1960s, Kid played one of her most famous parts, the villainous vixen Catwoman. She took over the role on the TV series Batman from Julie Newmar. Remarkably, Kid only played Catwoman on a handful of episodes of the short-lived campy crime show, starring Adam West and Burt Ward. But she made the role her own with her little cat-like frame and her distinctive voice. The series found a second life in reruns and it remains on the air today. Known for being blunt and short-tempered at times, Kid found herself in a media firestorm in 1968. She attended a luncheon on the subject of juvenile delinquency and crime, hosted by Lady Bird Johnson at the White House. At the event, Kit shared her thoughts on the matter, telling the First Lady that you send the best of this country off to be shot and maimed, according to the Washington Post. No wonder the kids rebel. Her remarks against the Vietnam War offended Johnson and made headlines. Her popularity took a significant hit after that, and she spent several years mostly performing abroad. In 1978, Kit enjoyed a career renaissance with her performance on Broadway in Timbuktu. She earned a Tony Award nomination for her role in the play and received an invitation to the White House by President Jimmy Carter. In 1984, Kit returned to the music charts with Where Is My Man? She continued to win acclaim for her music, including scoring a Grammy Award nomination for 1994's Back in Business. Throughout her adult life, Kit had a tremendous work ethic. She kept up a busy work schedule well into her 70s. In 2000, Kit netted a Tony Award nomination for her work in The Wild Party with Tony Collette. She picked up a Daytime Emmy Award for her vocal performance on the animated children's series The Emperor's New School that same year and again in 2007. For many years, Kit performed her cabaret act at New York's Cafe Carlisle. She continued to wow audiences as she had so many decades before when she was the toast of Paris. With her voice, charm, and sassy appeal, Kit knew how to win over a crowd. Kit learned that she had colon cancer in 2006, a disease that ended up taking her life on December 25th, 2008. Hello, welcome back to 28 Days of Color. Today we're talking about color in cosplay. And today I have with us Kenyatta Todd. Good morning. Hi, glad to be here. 
I have been looking at your images and I've seen your work in person before. And so today I'm excited to have you on the show and share you with our viewers. The first thing I wanna do is kind of break down the word cosplay. I know that it means costume play, but how would you describe cosplay? Well, it, literally, yes, it does mean costume play, but um, the main part of the costume play is your own imagination and your own creativity. So it's open to anybody's interpretation. You can have one idea of a, of a character, say something simple like uh, Big Bird. Okay. <laughs> Maybe you you want your Big Bird to be a different color. You could have a purple Big Bird. Okay. You can have an orange Big Bird. You can name him something else. He could be Big Bad Bird, whatever. But, you know, that's your kind of caught twist to the costume play. Right. And then how long have you been doing cosplay and what characters have you done? It, if you really think about it, I think everybody's been doing costume play since Halloween was invented. So it's kind of like, you know, you grow up and you still love that aspect of Halloween, but you have to wait for Halloween for it to come around. Mm -hmm. Well, cosplay kind of takes that off the, off the, game forward so now you can pretty much have halloween whenever you want it just you know i never lost that creativity you know and what I, whatever i did and so when i got older and i learned oh there's cosplay there's not just halloween okay it's on it's on <laughs> the the whole aspect of uh, i also like to sew and so now i can make costumes and then they don't have to actually i can you know i've always wanted to act and be in movies and stuff like that so that's also another part of it that if you have a group of friends that also like the cosplay you can do your own little skits your own little plays you can put these things on youtube it can you can make your own funny little shows twists yes. on comic book shows and stuff like that which is just so much fun well, how small or large is the presence of cosplay in the Black community? You would not believe how big it is. Okay, oh. every year there's an actual convention, well, every year, that was before the coronavirus thing happened. Right. There was a convention in Virginia called the Blurred Convention, and that's basically, um, in a, Blurred stands for Black Nerds. So it was basically, <laughs> a blurred convention and it was all people of color yes. and we all dressed up in cosplay and we had this we just bought our hotels and just had it was like a comic-con only in virginia and it was people of color and we would have um famous stars would show up in cosplay disguise oh and take pictures with people and later reveal Guess who was here from the Black Panther? And I oh. took a picture with her and I didn't even know it. <laughs> like, yes, oh yes, God. stars like that would show up. So yeah, there was a big, big presence in uh, in Virginia every year. And, but since COVID has happened, the thing is, let's, people are trying to take that to virtual reality now. How has the cosplay scene changed over the years? I mean, as far as diversity, you were just mentioning, you know, the blurred, yeah. Event. Well, the comic books, a lot of the comic books have led the way. Marvel, for one, I'm a big fan of Marvel. I do like DC too, but let me just put it this. Marvel has great heroes, DC has awesome villains. I was just gonna leave it like that. That's that's my take. I am a Marvel girl, yes. Yeah, yeah. So um, what Marvel did was it started incorporating a lot of people of color into their comic books. Right? Mrs. Marvel is now Iranian. Hey. Uh, Spider-Man is now an uh, African-American kid from the Bronx. Yeah, we saw that. Yes, we did see that. So he's switching up a lot of the characters in the comic books so they are people of color. You don't see that in the movies yet. But if you're following the comic books, there are a lot of change. There are Mexican superheroes. There are handicapped superheroes. You don't see them in films yet, but the comic books are way ahead of the films. So that's why I'm really still into comics too. Right. And, you know, we'll be talking about uh, the first Joker that was Latino. Yeah. And we'll be talking about the kids, Catwoman. Yes, yes. Oh, and I met her. Bertha Kid and I met Michelle Nichols. Yes, Michelle Michelle <laughs> Michelle Nichols from Star Trek was probably the very first person 
that inspired me to do anything in cosplay, anything in film, anything with TV whatsoever. When I saw her in Star Trek for the first time, my mouth fell open and I was hooked for life because to see her on film, to me, that represented that there was a place for women of color in the future and they had positions of power and she had her own command station. She was not right. in the ship, running <laughs> around, handing people drinks. No, Thank she you. had her own command station and she was in charge and I loved her from the start. And I got to dress up as her, go to a cosplay convention, meet her, and oh. she made me sit down next to her and put up the starch. I almost fainted. Cosplay in the movies, uh, Aaliyah, you know, she played oh. a fantastic role in the movie Queen of the Dam, and she left us way too soon. And I got to play her in cosplay. And I made this headpiece. I knew I recognized that. Yes, I made oh, this headpiece. Oh it's my! A replica God. of the one she wore in the movie, and I got to play her in several shows. So, yeah, that's oh, another aspect God. of cosplay. If you have a character that you really feel strongly about, you can represent that character and still go around and represent that character. Some of the pieces are leather. And some of the pieces are wood that have been spray painted and the jewelry I got from, uh, you know, Goodwill antique shops and stuff like that. So the things that you find for your cosplay, I like going to secondhand shops, thrift stores, because I'll walk down the aisles and sometimes I'll see an outfit and sometimes it just calls to me like, you know, I was a good dress, but please make me into something else because I'm still beautiful, <laughs> you know? So I will grab that garment and completely disassemble it and use that fabric to make something completely amazing. That's how I made my first storm costume and it turned out fantastic. I wow. just saw the dress, it was black and silver and shiny. And I said, you know what? That reminds me of storm. So I grabbed it and it became something else and it has been repeated and repeated and she's using these to get that. What is a common misconception of cosplay that you can clear up? Um, a misconception is that it's just for kids, that it's just for kids and that you have to have a lot of money to get to it. And, and you really don't. You can start out simple. And some of the best cosplays I have seen are from people that are over 30. Where can people go to see cosplay events and, and which have you attended? We heard about Blurred. Yeah, there's um, the biggest one right now is probably the San um, San Jose Co Comic Con, and it's just really huge. It's global, but now they have them all over the world. If you really want to get to look at some of the best of the top line cosplayers um, around the world, and these people have. I don't have these kind of machines. They're making their armor out of and big giant foam swords right. and stuff like that. But just do a little YouTube Google search on cos past cosplay convention, you know, and they'll show you just about how much fun these people are having, and you know, and and there'll be little links in the comments if you look to places that you can still go to now on the internet, and and people upload pictures of their costumes and give you little tips on how to make your own costumes and stuff. For the little kids, start small, you know, get yourself a little pair of gloves, cut out some uh, some felt felt triangles and glue them to the side of the glove. Make yourself some superhero gloves. Oh! Get yourself a little mask. Get yourself a little pillowcase and make the cape. There you go. You got one start to one little superhero costume ready to go. Add on to it every year, you know. I have one uh, Mardi Gras costume that I started small and every year I just keep adding to it. I'm not changing it. I'm just gonna add more and more and more and more to it. You know, you, you can have several costumes. Right now I have about one costume for every holiday and several wow. special events. So, yeah. So after a year like 2020, our social and political unrest has found its way into popular culture. Everything from television to Facebook memes. So I wanna know, how have the events of 2020 affected the cosplay world? And how are you seeing that? A lot of people are cosplaying political people. Nowadays, you see a lot of that, you see a lot of joking memes about it and stuff. I try to steer away from political 
things, you know, because it's it's already out there. It's everywhere. And if you're going to do cosplay, I try to keep it light and try to, you know, keep the fun in it because there's a lot of chaos going on right now. You need a little fun space. So I right. try to keep it a fun space and I try to keep politics out of it. I try to keep um, an upbeat swing on it, you know, so and, and try to push a positive message all the time. So what are some of the benefits of cosplay? And what type of things do we see in movies and television every day that are a form of cosplay? Um, well, a lot of the benefits of cosplay are, first of all, active imagination. And um, you learn different skills from different people. I'm a sewer. I'm, I have sewing machines. I, I can do a lot of sewing. But also cosplay is a lot of intricate work. So it, it can it involves a lot of gluing. So there's a lot of hot gluing going on. There's different textures. You need to figure out how I can make this look like this without actually being this. And that's a lot of the fun part. How do I make this look like dragon scales without actually having dragon scales? You know, how can I make that? How can I make this dragon's egg without actually having a dragon's egg? That's part of the fun of it, trying to figure it out and how, how it works. And in, it, as, as we look around us in society, we see cosplay all the time from the from the characters, you know, pizza, pizza man on the pizza box. Or, yeah. You know, he's a little cosplay character, you know, the guys on the corner spinning the signs, they're little characters on the corners. You know, there's, there's cosplay going on all around you. Everybody that wears a uniform, just because it's called uniform, don't believe it's not cosplay. <laughs> you still recognize them by that uniform you know there's cosplay all around you from the music videos you see you know people dressing up in music videos and acting those out uh, every movie is cosplay none of that stuff is real <laughs> somebody behind there is saying this person needs to wear this outfit in this scene that hat's not gonna go right that person is an expert cosplayer well what else would you like to tell our viewers about cosplay I expect to see a lot more, a lot more cosplay, a lot more cosplay acting. I want to see what you can do in some little skits. Send it to your teacher because I want to see them. I'd like to have some of those skits so I can put a, in a little cosplay show, a little cosplay forum, you know, for kids to watch, to, to show their own stuff. It would be great, yeah. And have little tips on how to make their costumes and how to make them better and upgrade certain levels if they want to go here or there. Yeah, yeah. Oh my goodness. This has been one of my favorite interviews. I really enjoyed talking to you about this and geeking out with you for a little yes, bit. Yes. And I hope that everyone enjoys getting to find out about you and, and what you do and hearing more about cosplay. And I oh, hope that I wanna re I do want to recommend one comic book. Yeah. yeah. I gotta I gotta throw that out there one time. There's uh -huh. a comic book called Prince Less. And so this comic book, the premise of this comic book is that there are these princesses and when they get to be of age, the king usually locks them in a tower and puts dragons around the bottom so nobody can come and get them. But the princesses are tired of being locked in the towers. So they said, you know what? We're out of here. We're gonna rescue ourselves. So one princess gets away and she goes to rescue the other princesses out of their locked towers because she said, I am Prince Less. I don't need a prince to save me. I can save myself. <laughs> oh, oh. Yes, yes. yes. Prince oh, Les. And up. the author of the comic book lives right here in California, in Sonoma County. So yes, yes, yes. Wow. Great story. Yes. Oh, I need to know about that. Yes. Thank you so much for doing this interview with me. I really Welcome. appreciate your time. And I look forward to working with you more because yeah. I would like to start my lady I'm dinner. I'm coming back to see you. what they sent you. <laughs> yes, it'll be fun. It'll be fun. Right. Thank Thanks you. Thanks for having me. We hope you enjoyed today's show on cosplay. And to close out with that theme in mind, today I'll be finishing the day with a childhood favorite of my own, Amazing Grace, written by Mary Hoffman and Carolyn Binch. In this story, a young girl finds out that she too can be Peter Pan and all the characters of her favorite stories. I hope that you enjoy it. We'll see you tomorrow. Bye-bye. Grace was a girl who loved stories. She didn't mind if they were read to her or told to her or made up in her own head. 
She didn't care if they were in books or movies or out of Nana's long memory. Grace just loved stories. After she had heard them, and sometimes while they were still going on, Grace would act them out, and she always gave herself the most exciting part. Grace went into battle as Joan of Arc and wove a wicked web as Anansi the spider. She hid inside the wooden horse at the gates of Troy. She went exploring for lost kingdoms. She sailed the seven seas with a peg leg and a parrot. She was Aladdin rubbing his magic lamp to make the genie appear and Mowgli in the backyard jungle. Most of all, Grace loved to act out adventure stories and fairy tales. When there was no one around, Grace played all the parts herself. She set out to seek her fortune with no companion but her trusty cat and found a city with streets paved in gold. Sometimes she could get Ma and Nana to join in when they weren't too busy. Then she was Dr. Grace, and their lives were in her hands. One day, Grace's teacher said they would do the play Peter Pan. Grace knew who she wanted to be. When she raised her hand, Raj said, You can't be Peter, that's a boy's name. But Grace kept her hand up. You can't be Peter Pan, whispered Natalie. He isn't black. But Grace kept her hand up. All right, said the teacher. Lots of you want to be Peter Pan, so we'll have auditions next week to choose parts. She gave them words to learn. When Grace got home, she seemed sad. What's the matter, asked Ma. Raj said I can't be Peter Pan because I'm a girl. That just shows what Raj knows, said Ma. A girl can be Peter Pan if she wants to. Grace cheered up. Then later, she remembered something else. Natalie says I can't be Peter Pan because I'm black, she said. Ma looked angry. But before she could speak, Nana said, It seems that Natalie's another one who don't know nothing. You can be anything you want, Grace, if you put your mind to it. On Saturday, Nana told Grace they were going out. In the afternoon, they caught a bus and train into town. Nana took Grace to a grand theater. The sign outside read Rosalie Wilkins in Romeo and Juliet in sparkling lights. Are we going to the ballet, Nana? asked Grace. We are, honey, but first I want you to look at this picture. Grace looked up and saw a beautiful young ballerina in a tutu. Above the dancer it said, Stunning new Juliet. That one is little Rosalie from back home in Trinidad, said Nana. Her granny and me, we grew up together on the island. She's always asking me, do I want tickets to see her Rosalie dance? So this time, I said yes. After the ballet, Grace played the part of Juliet, dancing around her room in her imaginary tutu. I can be anything I want, she thought. On Monday, the class met for auditions to choose who was best for each part. When it was Grace's turn to be Peter, she knew exactly what to do and all the words to say. She had been Peter all weekend. She took a deep breath and imagined herself flying. When it was time to vote, the class chose Raj to be Captain Hook and Natalie to be Wendy. There was no doubt who would be Peter Pan. Everyone voted for Grace. You were fantastic, whispered Natalie. The play was a big success, and Grace was an amazing, amazing Peter Pan. After it was all over, she said, I feel as if I could fly all the way home. You probably could, said Ma. Yes, said Nana. If Grace put her mind to it, she can do anything she wants. The end. Yeah, 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 yeah.
Thank you. 